everybody and welcome back to Red Menace. Today on Red Menace, we will be covering the text by Harry Haywood entitled For a Revolutionary Position on the Negro Question. As usual, if you like what we do here at Red Menace, you can go support us on Patreon, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube page. Everything is now centrally located at revolutionaryleftradio.com. When you go to the website, you can see both Rev Left and Red Menace's logo. You click on either one and it'll take you like into a portal to see the Patreon and the Twitter account of the respective shows. Um, so if you want to support the show, joining our Patreon is a great way to do it. Plus, you also get bonus content. And I also want to mention that this episode will be coming out in conjunction with an episode we did on Revolutionary Left Radio where we interviewed the daughter of Harry Haywood, Dr. Rebecca Hall. It's a fascinating conversation. She's actually a PhD in history and is writing a graphic novel on women-led slave revolts. So our conversation and her reflections about her childhood um, with Harry Haywood as her father is, is, is fascinating. So after you listen to this, uh, go definitely go check that out. And before we start, I also want to mention up front, and we will mention it again at the end of the show, that next month's reading will be Wretched of the Earth uh, by Franz Fanon. We're going to start that book. It's obviously a bigger text than what we've tackled thus far, so we'll probably break that up into two, three discrete episodes over time. But if you want to get a head start on reading that, definitely be our guest. That will be the next uh, work that we tackle. And then after we complete Wretched of the Earth, I think both Allison and I agree that we're going to go back to original Marx and Engels texts and work through them with all the stuff we've learned thus far uh, firmly in our mind. But again, today is uh, the text for a revolutionary position on the Negro question by communist and Marxist-Leninist Harry Haywood. So with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into part one, the explanation and summary of the text itself. Allison, you want to take it? Yep. All right, let's do this. So first, I want to go ahead and give some of the historical context for this text, because it can be a little bit difficult to unpack. So uh, this text written by Harry Haywood is sort of about internal debates within the Communist Party USA uh, in the 1950s, and specifically debates about their line on black liberation. So Haywood, perhaps most famous for his text Black Bolshevik, which is his sort of autobiography, uh, was a black communist and Marxist-Leninist and anti-revisionist within the Communist Party USA who defended the Black Belt thesis of self-determination that basically claimed that Black people in the United States uh, qualified as a nation in the sense that Joseph Stalin talks about in his works such as Marxism and the national question. And so because of this, Haywood argued that essentially national liberation was an important struggle for Black liberation and that communists had to center around the right to Black secession even and self-determination within the U.S. And so for a time, this was actually sort of the predominant view within the Communist Party USA, but it eventually began to shift as certain factions began to oppose it more openly. So Haywood sort of began to develop this thesis actually when he was overseas studying in the USSR. He had the awesome honor of being a dual card member of the CPUSA and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union simultaneously. He was put basically in charge of the Comintern Committee that was supposed to come up with the position on Black liberation in the Americas and had the chance to study the application of the national question question in Russia, which of course has been referred to as the prison house of nations. And so it's there that he came up with this idea of applying self-determination in the national question to black liberation in the United States. Now, as time went on and as the party began to reassess the situation, they noted that there was massive black migration from the south into more urban centers and the north, and many people within the party argued that this meant the Black Belt thesis was obsolete. So the text that we're looking at today is Haywood's defense of the Black Belt thesis, and an argument that even with demographic shifts, and even with some agricultural decreases that have occurred in terms of black livelihood in the south, it is still relevant for self-determination to be on the forefront of how we view Black liberation in the United States. So with that context, let's get right into the text. So Haywood begins by examining the seriousness of the matter at hand. He really insists that this debate isn't just about our strategy of black liberation, but it's tied to a broader question of socialist strategy overall. He ties the question of black self-determination to the question of revisionism more largely, and he argues that the push against self-determination within the CPUSA is part of a broader revisionist push to gut the party of class struggle and to move towards a gradualist reform-based program instead of a revolutionary program. 
He writes, the key question involved in projecting a solution for the Negro question is the universal problem of reform or revolution. The reformist position on the Negro question claims that it is being solved on the basis of gradual progressive gains within the framework of the existing monopoly dominated system, end quote. And he further insists that, quote, our party can play its proper role only if we have a liberation of our own, a liberation from the paralyzing effects of revisionism, the slightly warmed over liberal gradualism, which seeks to destroy our revolution revolutionary position on the Negro question, end quote. So for Haywood, what's at stake here is much more than simply Black self-determination. It's maintaining a truly revolutionary line at all. So in order to defend the thesis of Black self-determination from the revisionist line, Haywood looks to the statements from former General Secretary of the CPUSA, Eugene Dennis, and his own report on the question of Black liberation. So Dennis argues that the party actually has to reassess its position on Black liberation and self-determination in order to avoid falling into dogmatism. Now, as a side note, I want to remind us that in what is to be done, Lenin points out that anti-dogmatism is actually often a rallying cry of those trying to push against the revolutionary line and insert opportunist ideas. That's a relevant concern here. So Dennis argues that self-determination thesis is out of touch with the actual views of Black Americans and is being imposed from on high by a party who applies it dogmatically. Dennis argues that racial integration is actually slowly occurring, and even though it's slow, it is a sure process, and that he also argues that migration of Black people from the South to the urban North means that the old party line is outdated. He argues that integration is recurring as a result of what he calls long-range economic trends brought about by capitalist modernization itself, and insists that revolutionary nationalism is not actually the correct solution to the problems of racial prejudice and oppression. The idea is essentially that as capitalism begins to modernize America, and the South, integration is naturally coming along with it. Haywood's response to this is quite frankly brutal and biting, as it should be. He ties this to a broader problem of revisionism, likening it to the broaderest idea of progressive capitalism. For Haywood, the choice to abandon the self-determination thesis corresponds to a choice to adopt a revisionist line on capitalism more broadly. There is a tacit claim within Dennis's idea that imperialist capitalism is resolving its problems on its own and is resolving black liberation and playing a progressive role. In this sense, there's a decision to abandon the need for a revolution in favor of the idea that capitalist development is gradually fixing its own problems. The party abandons the need of being a vanguard on this issue and says, let the forces of capitalism resolve it on its own. So having looked at Dennis's idea, Haywood next turns to the writing of Doxy Wilkerson, who claimed that black people living in the U.S. were actually making substantial gains under capitalism, both in terms of a reprieve from economic exploitation under agriculture, but also from violence by mobs. Wilkerson argues that not only has there been less mob violence against black people, but that black people have begun to receive more access to social mobility. And Wilkerson even goes so far as to argue that, quote, the whole Jim Crow edifice is threatened with destruction, end quote. To support these claims, Wilkerson cites shifts in population with a particular focus on the trend of black people moving from southern agricultural production to urban economies. He particularly argues that decrease in sharecropping has rendered much of the party's previous line obsolete. Now, in response to this, Haywood is going to develop much more criticism in much more depth later on, but he makes just one simple point here. He points out that Wilkerson's statements like this are coming mere months after the lynching of Emmett Till, implying that Wilkerson is ignoring obvious instances of intense mob violence and racial oppression that exists despite the so-called destruction of Jim Crow that Wilkerson says is occurring. So, Haywood next turns to criticizing the ideas of James Jackson, another party member, who claimed that reformist movements for integration were working well and that unity between black and white workers was necessary to combat monopoly capitalism. He further argued that this would require abandoning the previous party line on self-determination. So Haywood criticizes Jackson uh, and Wilkerson primarily for a belief in spontaneity, which rejects the need for a vanguard of black workers to lead the struggle. Again, we should be thinking back to Lenin here on what we covered when we looked at what is to be done. He argues that this is just the party abandoning the need to organize at the forefront of black liberation in the first place, and it's instead positioning the party as an external support institution for the black liberation struggle. And in this sense, the position adopted by Jackson is the type of economism that Lenin critiques in what is to be done. Haywood further argues that Jackson has failed to interrogate the relationship between U.S. imperialism and black oppression, instead opting to support the bourgeois lines of the NAACP instead of a revolutionary communist position. So these are kind of the ideas within the party that Haywood really wants to push back against in this tech. So Haywood then turns to presenting kind of a general criticism that responds to all of these various views that he's summarized so far. 
So he begins by first asserting that all of these views rely on a baseless faith in long term playing out in favor of black liberation. They hope that over the long term, the trend in American society will just naturally drift towards integration. And this is a faith in gradualism and natural organic reform that's ultimately quite unbecoming of a revolutionary party. Haywood does not deny that economic changes have occurred in America, but he contests Wilkerson's argument that this means that a gradual solution to black oppression is on the way. He concedes that black people have finally gained access to wage labor in ways that they weren't able to before, and that some level of proletarianization has occurred, but he contests the idea that this is leading to an end of racial prejudice and oppression in the United States. He notes that white workers still make three times as much as black workers, and that this number has actually been rising since migrational shifts to the North first started to occur. And so Haywood argues that this is because black migration into non-agricultural work has actually served to elevate the white worker to a higher position while giving black Americans jobs at the bottom of the ladder in terms of pay. Rather than seeing liberation through proletarianization, white workers have just been moved into a higher social status and black workers have been stuck with the jobs that they can't get white people to work. So he writes that, quote, just as the reservoir of Negro unemployment is the last to be tapped during an era of rising employment, Negro employment is primarily in positions for which it is most difficult to continue recruiting white labor. These are the lowest wage establishments, occupations, and industries. This means that the Negro workers have benefited least from prosperity. They've received merely the crumbs of prosperity while suffering the greater extent from inflation, slum conditions, and exorbitant rent and job insecurity. The growth of this economic gap has brought tremendous social pressure upon the Negro family, increasing the number of workers holding down two jobs and families with two or more wage earners. The burden is particularly heavy on Negro women. In 1955, 44% of all Negro women as compared to 34% of white women were in the workforce, and the median income for Negro women was $1,400 compared with $2,800 for white women." End quote. As far as Hayward Wood is concerned, this all contests the idea that gradual integration is leading to black liberation. Instead, it indicates that black migration to the North has not led to liberation, but a new subjugation and super exploitation under proletarian labor, wherein black workers are still subjugated to elevated levels of exploitation and social exclusion. Haywood also insists that despite modernization and partial technological automation, this gap between white laborers and black laborers is not only found in the northern proletarian, but is also found again among southern agricultural trends. In the south, concentration of farmland into the hands of small farms and corporations has hurt small farmers, but Haywood points out that it hurt black farmers at a much higher rate, with 43% of displacements being black farmers, with only 29% being from white farmers. At the same time, white sharecroppers were displaced at higher rates, which meant that there had to be a systemic push of black farmers into sharecropping in the first place. Thus, despite the overall decrease in sharecropping that occurred moving into the 50s, the concentration of black sharecroppers had not decreased, according to Haywood. All this has occurred in a time when agricultural technology had increased its effectiveness massively, but this had not organically made life easier for black people living in the South. Instead, it led to an increase in unemployment and sharecropping. Haywood concludes this section by insisting that, quote, we find the mechanization of agriculture far from being a boon to the Negro soil tiller has resulted in widespread unemployment and displacement of Negro sharecroppers and tenants from the land, pushing their status down to misery and the insecurity of seasonal agricultural work or out of agriculture entirely. The extension of the overpopulation in Southern agriculture due to mechanization, technological advances, shift of cotton production to the West, and diversification of crops, etc., has sharpened the contradictions in Southern agriculture, creating a highly explosive situation. So Haywood then, after doing all of that, turns again to addressing Jackson's arguments in particular. So Jackson has claimed that the increase in black northern workers and the decrease in black southern farmers transforms the question of black liberation such that, quote, the economic essence of the oppression of the Negro people in the country as a whole and in southern states is now manifested in the discrimination against and economic exploitation of Negro working men and women by industrial capital and monopoly, end quote. So in Jackson's view, black oppression does not function any longer as a national exploitation, but actually occurs part of a broader and more general proletarian exploitation. So Haywood summarizes this position fairly well when he writes, quote, This statement, it seems to us, is a denial of the pivotal role of the semi-feudal agrarian element in the national oppression of the Negro people generally, and in particular in the South. By a stroke of his pen, Jackson downgrades the struggle of the Negro people for national liberation in the South to a mere labor question, reducing the national element in this struggle to the fight against discrimination, which he evidently considers a superstructural hangover from a nearly extinct system whose economic base is being rapidly and automatically destroyed by the rapid tempo of urbanization and industrial growth.
end quote. So Haywood argues that Jackson wants to downplay the importance of the sharecropping system, giving its significance at most as having a small geographical distribution along with an outsized ideological influence on Southern law. Although in later texts, Jackson goes so far as to claim that sharecropping is no longer a major part of the Southern economy at all. And so what Haywood is concerned with is that on the one hand, Jackson is just denying the reality of sharecropping trends in the South, but on the other hand, is trying to reduce anti-Black racism and oppression to a mere superstructural remnant of slavery that supposedly has very little influence now. Haywood responds to these arguments by noting that in many southern states, sharecropping has actually increased, and this is where Haywood does some very interesting work. He looks at the states where sharecropping has increased and notes that they're also the states where mechanization of agriculture was most viable, and he looks at the states where sharecropping has decreased and notes that it's the states where it was least viable, which leads Haywood to reach the conclusion that mechanization has not actually abolished sharecropping in modernized conditions such that it would lead to relief for black farmers. It is actually just concentrated black sharecropping and exploitation of black farmers in those regions where automation occurs. The overall decrease in sharecropping is not because of automation or because of mechanization, but because some states, once mechanization developed, could no longer compete and abandon agriculture en masse. So of course sharecropping decreased in those states. Thus Haywood gives a real assessment of the way that migrational trends and agricultural trends contest Jackson's claim that mechanization will necessarily resolve black exploitation in the South. So Haywood then goes a step further in his response by arguing that sharecropping really should not be the single factor that we look at when we try to assess black oppression. Haywood wants to insist that even if Jackson was right and these sharecropping trends were decreasing, that would not be sufficient reason to reject the self-determination thesis. So he writes in what is honestly maybe one of the most important quotes in the whole book, quote, of course, one must not fail to notice that while the sharecropper status represents the purest survival of the old slave relationships, all categories of Negroes in Southern agriculture are either directly or indirectly decisively conditioned by these social relics of slavery, which have long since been adapted to the needs of monopoly capitalism. The shadow of the plantation prescribes strict limits for the development of the neighboring Negro tenant and owner, keeping him ever at the disadvantage in relation to white competitors. As renter or as owner, he is restricted to inferior land and denied equal commercial and banking services. The Negro workers no less find conditions for the most part predominated by the status of the Negro in agriculture. He is often still tied to the land, either directly as an agricultural wage labor or indirectly as a worker in the primary agricultural processing industries, ginning, logging, sawn milling, cane mills, etc. Even when he may move one step away into proper industry, he is generally restricted as a production worker to the heaviest, most dangerous and dirty work such as the extractive industries, mining, smelting, and fishing. The shadow of the plantation does not allow him as a producer, let alone some higher category, into the factories in Dixie, a few scattered tentative exceptions to the contrary notwithstanding. Beyond the South, wherever the Negro worker may go, coast to coast into the Canadian border, there he will find his people, whatever their class, living in the shadow of the plantation. And thus the historic condition of the development of Deep South agriculture, in which the plantation has been and remains a key form, has been the super exploitation of Negro labor. The consequences of racist national oppression fall upon the Negro, whatever his social status, in town or country. A change in the number of Negro sharecroppers cannot change this fact of Negro life. End quote. There's a lot to unpack there, but what is really important is that Haywood is drawing our attention to the shadow of the plantation that extends beyond mere sharecropping. Even if sharecropping had gone down in its total number, there still is a national exploitation and oppression of Black people that extends beyond that into all classes and into all circumstances. And it's that insight that is crucial in Haywood's rebuttal of Jackson. Now, having said that, Haywood finally summarizes the revisionist position on the question of Black liberation as follows. Quote, The Negro freedom struggle has now become, in the main, a fight against the superstructural element of racial discrimination. The hangover of a nearly extinct system whose socioeconomic basis is rapidly and automatically being dissolved by the forces of capitalist expansion. End quote. And it is that reduction of Black national liberation to mere racial discrimination that the revisionist uh, produce in order to push a path which abandons revolutionary national struggle. This view abandons the need for revolutionary struggle and instead argues that gradualist reforms that capitalist modernization will bring to the South through industrialization are sufficient to overcome whatever superstructural sources of anti-Black oppression still exist today. 
And Haywood argues that this reformulation is a capitulation to the black bourgeois reformists and to the white liberals who are opposed to self-determination because it threatens their interests. He also claims that this is just an instance of the party abandoning its position at the forefront of black liberation, noting that Jackson himself believes in his claim that the NAACP represented the fullest expression of political struggle for black liberation. In Haywood's view, Jackson simply wants the NAACP to do the work, even if they offer a reformist and bourgeois strategy. And thus, the abandonment of black self-determination is part of a broader abandonment of revolution and is a revisionist capitulation to opportunists and bourgeois reformers. It is the party choosing to no longer be the vanguard that represents all classes and leads in all struggles. While right assimilationist party members argued that post-war capitalism was moving towards integration with rulings such as Brown versus the Board of Education, Haywood shows us that this optimism was actually caused them to embrace gradualism and assume that the bourgeois had good intentions towards black people in the U.S., And Haywood notes quite correctly that in actuality, the implementation of the Supreme Court ruling really was not going well at the time. And he also points out that the recent right for blacks to be able to register to vote throughout the United States were not actually being implemented because Southern politicians were purging voter rolls or finding ways to make sure that black people couldn't register or vote in the first place. The supposed gradual integration was simply not happening because the remaining elements of the old slave system still continued to operate in the national oppression of black Americans. So, Haywood concludes the first half of the book by exclaiming, quote, If only revisionism could create the world to conform with its flights of fancy, but alas, ugly reality will assert itself, and the historically developed national oppression of the Negro people is not disappearing with the wave of a magic wand, end quote, and but that it were so easy. Haywood insists that any gains brought about through the courts or by modernization have been met essentially with anti-black counter-revolution to ensure that the legacy of slavery lives on. He again writes, quote, What the revisionists miss is that the changes of the war and post-war period by no means blunt the contradictions between the aspirations of the Negro people and U.S. imperialism. On the contrary, urbanization of the Negro people and the vast extension of the Negro working class, the growth of the Negro trade union membership, and the new relationship of world forces have brought into the arena of struggle new and fresh forces and have sharpened the crisis of Wall Street Dixie crap rule in the South, end quote. The changes that have occurred do not mean that the party needs to abandon the revolutionary position, according to Haywood. It means that now it was the time more than ever to embrace that position and take advantage of increased tensions and contradictions. And so Haywood dis- insists, despite the critiques of opportunists and chauvinists in power, that, quote, the semi-feudal national oppression of the Negro people in the Deep South will not die by itself. It can only be destroyed through mass revolutionary struggle led by a marxist leninist vanguard party, end quote. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And that, that covers the first half of the text, and so I'll cover the second half. And the way that Harry Haywood starts the second half is by laying out a definition of self-determination in the context of black Americans. So Haywood goes on in a chapter entitled The Right of Self-Determination to lay out the argument for black self-determination rooting it in an historical and political analysis. He discusses the centuries of brutal slavery that black people had to endure at the hands of the U.S. state and argues that the ostensible codification of equality in documents like the Bill of Rights were a mockery and never evenly applied across race and class. The Civil War, Haywood contends, did not bring real freedom to black people. Instead, they were cheated out of owning the land that they worked, and given the absolute lack of opportunities for newly freed slaves, many black people were forced back onto the plantations they worked as slaves to work as semi-slave servants. Importantly, Haywood also covers the rise of U.S. imperialism as industrial capitalism morphed into monopoly capitalism and the capitalist class united with the former slaveholding class in the South in order to oppose rising democratic and populist movements, including the black and white unity emerging among the working class and poor during that time. Here he makes it clear once again that the black liberation movement, in order to defeat the common enemy of oppressed peoples all around the world, which he identifies as U.S. imperialism, must unite with the white, poor, and working class, as well as the international movements for socialism and national liberation. And in order to solve what Haywood calls the Negro question in the U.S., black people must be given the land in the South that they worked for centuries, as well as the full development of a black nation in the Deep South under socialism. Put another way, Harry Haywood is arguing here that it's not black suffrage or gradual integration that will lead to genuine black self-determination and liberation. It is land and political power in the form of a socialist and autonomous black nation state 
in the South. Malcolm X would say only a few years later that America could have the first bloodless revolution in history if and only if they gave the black people in this country everything that is their due. That statement by Malcolm can be understood as an echo of this argument by Harry Haywood. Quote, this is the meaning of self-determination, wrote Haywood, that Negro people in full possession of their homeland have the right to decide the political future of that area, end quote. But Haywood also understands here that even with the formal and legal end of slavery and forms of discrimination, the economic and cultural disparity between black people and whites will not immediately disappear, including the deeply ingrained white chauvinism among the white population. This is why Haywood argues that black folks cannot count on the formal laws of the U.S. government to protect them, and the only way to really protect the equality of black people is through the concrete form of political power. From that position of political power, black people could then reach out to the white working class in a socialist context and grant them concrete aid in the overcoming of their economic and cultural differences. And while Haywood acknowledges that full self-determination in the form of concrete political power is not on the immediate horizon yet, he argues that it should be the goal of black liberationists and socialists. At this point, Haywood turns his criticism toward the CPUSA, highlighting how the right of self-determination as a line within the party was withdrawn from above, and that this withdrawal was a product of the opportunism, white chauvinism, and capitulation to U.S. imperialism within the party, and in turn strengthened all of those currents within the party. This move hurt and alienated the black working class comrades within the party, destroying trust between them and their white counterparts. Haywood goes on to say, quote, It is impossible for the working class in the United States to organize an effective revolutionary movement and advance to socialism without fighting for full freedom for the Negro nation in the Deep South, that is, to determine their own fate, end quote. So after defining and laying out the case for self-determination and what it would really mean in concrete terms, and after criticizing the party for its failure to support self-determination, Haywood turns to an analysis of how revisionists redefine the concept of self-determination. He argues that the revisionists aren't against self-determination in general, but what they do is argue that the idea of a black nation in the South, the very mechanism of self-determination as Haywood has already laid out, is unacceptable instead favoring integration. By denying black people a homeland and by jettisoning the very idea of political power in the form of a state apparatus, the revisionists stripped the concept of self-determination of the primary mechanism that would be used to bring it about. Haywood goes on to assert that the imperialist oppressors would welcome such a concept because it represents an abstract idea of self-determination in general while rejecting any concrete material steps towards actually gaining it. In short, it sounds nice, but ultimately, it's meaningless. Allen represents the opportunist, gradualist, and integrationist line within the the Communist Party, arguing that black people need to wait for the maturing of all the elements of nationhood before committing to the idea of national self-determination. Haywood strikes back, arguing that imperialist policy with regards to the national question is designed to distort, slow, arrest, and destroy such progress in order to maintain the extraction of super profits. So the very gradual maturing process that Allen is arguing for assumes that imperialism has no effect on that process. Haywood mocks that idea, showing how keeping oppressed nations in a state of backwardness and underdevelopment is actually a crucial part of the imperialist playbook, and arguing that Allen confuses the classic period of capitalist development with the imperialist epoch, prescribing strategies based on an older and outdated understanding of capitalist development. Haywood finishes off this segment by saying, quote, We U.S. communists are deeply concerned over the national liberation struggle of the Algerian people. But the acid test of internationalism for U.S. communists is, first of all, how do we stand on self-determination for peoples directly oppressed by U.S. imperialism? For example, the Negro people in the Deep South and the peoples of Latin America, including Puerto Rico. Allen's quote-unquote self-determination in general for the Negro people, Haywood goes on, brings to mind what Lenin said about so-called socialists who are for self-determination of nations oppressed by other imperialist nations, but not for those nations oppressed by their own imperialists, end quote. So after laying out these debates and showing how opportunist lines justify themselves, Haywood moves on to an analysis of the elements of nationhood, of the core aspects in their elementary form of potentiality for nationhood status for black people in the Deep South. 
The reason he takes his argument in this direction is to prove that these elements do exist as a concrete potentiality which can become a reality under certain conditions, arguing against the line put forward by Allen. Haywood immediately highlights sovereign territory and autonomous economic life as crucial aspects of nationhood and showcases how the oppressed black people already have a desire for these things, but are prevented from achieving them via the brutal racist oppression of the U.S. monopoly capitalist state. He also shows how all classes which are essential to social development exist already in the black belt. However, even though these elements of a potential nation exist, the conditions that would allow this potential to blossom into reality do not exist, for they require the overthrow of ruling class hegemony and the unification with the struggle of the American working class broadly. Nonetheless, Haywood believes this should be the goal of the Communist Party, and they should actively work to create these very conditions instead of throwing out the possibility altogether in favor of integration into the capitalist state. Responding once again to opportunist lines, using Allen as Lenin used Kotsky or as Rosa used Bernstein, Haywood lays out a forceful argument that the Black Belt is historically the homeland of the U.S. Negro, as he puts it, as they have lived there for centuries, worked the land, and formed an essential part of the accumulation process upon which the entire U.S. economy and society was founded. He shows how, even with migrations out of the South and to the North, the Black Belt holds a black population which, at the time he was writing, was larger than the total population of 34 countries who were then members of the United Nations, arguing that, as such, it certainly constitutes an oppressed nation based on historical reality and current population numbers alone. Now, I actually looked up the most recent census data to see if this still held true today, and even with half a century of migration and population changes, the Black Belt is still deeply populated by black people and represents the largest concentration of black folks of any region inside the country. As of 2000, the United States had 96 counties with a black population of over 50%, and 95 of those counties were located in the Black Belt. So even through time, over many decades, Haywood's argument here is still firmly intact. But I digress. The point Haywood is making here is that this area, known as the Black Belt, regardless of population trends which ebb and flow, constitute a region that should belong to black people, and which should be the territory from which a black socialist state can emerge. And remember, a big part of Haywood's argument about achieving true equality is that in order to really achieve it, Black people can't simply be the beneficiaries of gradual reform and integration into a fundamentally oppressive and racist U.S. imperialist state, but must rather have autonomous political power in the form of a socialist state of their own of some form or another. And he talks about the nuances that this, that this state and this autonomous territory could take, but he says any move in this direction is important. So to round off this argument, he quotes Lenin on the subject, as well as the general program for the People's Republic of China for the implementation of regional autonomy for nationalities, connecting his specific argument up with broader international socialist movement, highlighting how his position is aligned with theirs and showing that, in any case, the question of having a majority of people in a given area is not a condition for autonomy. He ends this section by arguing that even though he is using the Black Belt as a general regional area for self-determination, the exact territorial boundaries of this potential nationhood cannot be determined at this point, as they would be determined at the appropriate time and on the basis of the interests of the formerly oppressed people. He goes on to estimate that it may include the entire Lower South, but admits that the question remains open. The main thing, he says, is that, quote, the objective basis for a national revolutionary movement directed towards some form of territorial autonomy does exist in the Deep South, end quote. In the next section, Haywood lays out the two predominant tendencies with regards to the national question. This is an extensive quote, so bear with me here. Haywood says, quote, Lenin pointed to two tendencies in the national question, both universal laws of imperialism. There is the tendency toward integration and amalgamation of nations due to the formation of a world market, to internationalize modes of production and exchange, to bring nations economically together, and to gradually unite vast territories into one integral whole. But imperialism can achieve this unity only by means of violence and oppression. And as a result, the other tendency arises which finds its expression in the struggle of the oppressed peoples of colonial and dependent nations to liberate themselves from imperialist oppression. This is precisely the main contradiction of the imperialist system. Haywood goes on, 
These two tendencies are utterly irreconcilable under imperialism, because imperialism can only unite nations by force and colonial conquest. For communism, he says, on the contrary, these tendencies are but two sides of the single cause, the cause of emancipation of oppressed peoples from the yoke of imperialism, because communism knows that the union of nations into a single world economic system, i.e. communism, is possible only on the basis of mutual confidence and voluntary agreement, and that the road to the formation of a voluntary union of nations lies through national freedom and the right of self-determination. End quote. Building off of this understanding, Haywood shows how the revisionist defense of integration over self-determination negates the revolutionary trend within the party. And by denying that revolutionary trend, the revisionists slide back into liberal reformism. And via that slide into liberalism, places racial discrimination as the main factor of black oppression, eschewing materialism and jettisoning Marxism-Leninism in favor of liberalism. Haywood says, quote, Now the cat is out of the bag. After all these gyrations, these frantic efforts designed to cover an essentially liberal position behind a smokescreen of Marxist-Leninist terminology, it turns out that the quote-unquote new look, the so-called creative application of Marxism-Leninism to the American scene, has led to a startling new discovery. The Negro question is essentially a race question. They thus reduce the struggle for Negro rights to a struggle against the superstructural remnant of quote-unquote racial prejudice, end quote. Haywood goes on to summarize how the revisionists that he is attacking have distorted Marxist-Leninist theory, have exchanged a revolutionary strategy for one of gradualist integration, have abdicated a vanguard role, and have repudiated the fight for proletarian hegemony. Since revisionism is the practice of accommodationism to the ruling class, the revisionists within the party have attacked the party's most advanced revolutionary positions and sought to paper over contradictions and thereby conceal the profound revolutionary nature of the fight for black liberation and class struggle. They have also capitulated to chauvinism and U.S. imperialism over proletarian internationalism. Haywood goes on to say, quote, In theory, the revisionist position belittles the role of the most conscious element in the Negro liberation movement, the Negro proletariat. In practice, it converts the party into a feeble appendage of Negro bourgeois reformism, their so-called enlightened imperialist sponsors among the white liberals and the social democratic trade union bureaucrats with their perspective of imminent, peaceful, democratic integration of the Negro people within the framework of the existing social order dominated by the Wall Street oligarchy. In some, it means tailism, or more specifically, confining the struggle for Negro rights to that level and within those limits acceptable to the Negro bourgeois assimilationist leaders, end quote. Comrade Haywood goes on in the next few sections to trace the devolution into revisionism by the party and how, in the hands of revisionist leadership, the all-class unity among blacks shifted away from emphasizing the leading role of the black worker and towards that of emphasizing the black bourgeoisie. This shift represented yet another headward fall into revisionism, as principled class unity among black liberationists was transformed into class collaboration. A pamphlet put out by Charles T. Mann in 1953 is then used by Haywood to highlight the theoretical work in the party which paved the way for this revisionism. The pamphlet, which was circulated in the party widely, represented an opening attack against black working class cadres and its trade unionists who Mann accused of being left sectarians because they did not accept bourgeois leadership. It also distorted the all-class unity concept, interpreting it to mean the uncritical acceptance of the black right reformist leadership. Haywood talks about how he wrote a piece combating Mann's article both of whom used Stalin to bolster and back up their arguments, but Mann using him opportunistically and, as Haywood says, quote, quoting Stalin out of space and time, and thereby violating the most elementary requirement of dialectics. He fails to take into account that what was correct in one historical situation may turn out to be incorrect in another, end quote. Bouncing off all of this, Haywood then goes into an analysis of the black bourgeoisie and how the white U.S. imperialist state has used and helped develop class distinctions in the black population in order to exert ideological control over the black population and to continue to promulgate imperialism around the world. I will quote extensively from Haywood here. Quote, The black upper class is seeking to accommodate itself to the overwhelmingly dominant imperialist bourgeoisie. 
This accounts for the fact that the Negro bourgeoisie has never raised fundamental demands for Negro liberation and for the growing aspirations of a section of the upper stratum to become compradors, i.e. direct economic and political agents of imperialism, not only in relation to the Negro market, but also in regard to the colonial and semi-colonial lands of Africa. The fact is that American imperialism has great plans for utilization of this section of the Negro bourgeoisie. It finds it essential to its strategy of world domination to hold Africa, quote, as a reserve continent, end quote, for imperialism and prevent its following Asia's example. As a recent editorial in the New York Times said, November 17, 1957, quote, from the ranks of our own Negro fellow citizens, we can find men and women who can play useful roles in building bridges between the United States and Africa, end quote. Haywood goes on. The fact that the Negro nation is set down in the midst of the leading imperialist nation has affected the various classes among the Negro people in a special way. The economic weakness of the Negro bourgeoisie is one effect of class structure. The existence of a large and growing intelligentsia is in fundamental conflict with imperialism. They represent a powerful potential ally for the working class movement. In order to maintain the suppression of the Negro people, Wall Street, operating through its enlightened liberal wing, has long adopted a conscious policy of building up a top stratum among the Negro intelligentsia, an intellectual elite to act as a buffer against the Negro masses. End quote. Here, Haywood is pointing directly to how class distinctions are used by the ruling class to separate and dismantle the black liberation movement, inviting the upper uh, class of blacks into its ranks in order to stem the tide of black liberation and self-determination from below. This class divide still plays out to this very day. One need look no further than the contradiction between the Obama presidency and the black community at home, as well as the oppressed peoples abroad. While Obama was pitched as representing a post-racial America and his success was intended to be seen as the success of the entire black population in the United States, the fact is that he perpetuated the same ruling class economics domestically and the same U.S. imperialism abroad. The figure of Obama was used as ideological fog to paper over real class and racial contradictions, all in the name of the furtherance of the U.S. capitalist imperialist state. Haywood would not at all be surprised at any of this. For this is precisely what he was calling out in these sections. At that time, as well as in our own time, these moves served to maintain the hegemony of the ruling class and to perpetuate anti-communism, and when these trends emerge within black liberationist or communist spaces, they represent a structural threat to those movements. Revisionism is so nefarious precisely because it so often cloaks itself in the garb of radicalism and liberation and operates to weaken proletarian movements from the inside like cancer eating away at vital organs. Haywood finishes these sections up by saying, quote, Strategically, the fight for proletarian leadership involves the recognition of the existence of two distinct, diametrically opposed trends within the Negro movement. The right bourgeois reformist trend, which holds that Negro equality can be attained within the framework of the imperialist-dominated social structure through collaboration with the ruling class enemy, and the proletarian position of consistent anti-imperialist struggle in alliance with white labor. The achievement of proletarian hegemony is a long-range struggle for winning the masses from the ideological influence of the Negro bourgeoisie, end quote. Now, it's important to remember that this text was written by Haywood a year or so before he was officially expelled by the CPUSA. It was a last-ditch effort to save the party from a terminal decline into revisionism, and it was an effort that eventually failed, as we see today. In 1959, Haywood tried one last time to get the party back on track, even after he was no longer a functioning party member, by writing a text called On the Negro Question. But at that point, most of his comrades within the party had been expelled as well, and it ultimately fell on deaf ears. The ostensible reason that was given for the expulsion of Haywood and his like-minded comrades from the party was their quote-unquote left sectarianism and dogmatism. Now, Allison already said this, but I want to reiterate, if listeners remember our previous episodes on Lenin, specifically his text, What is to be Done?, then you should remember how Lenin argued that at times this anti-dogmatism current in the, inside of a party doesn't actually stand against real dogmatism, but rather can act as a Trojan horse under which opportunist elements within a party smuggle in their revisionism. This exact thing happened to Haywood decades after Lenin himself died, once again showing the foresight and analytical power of Lenin's understanding, an understanding that Harry Haywood clearly learned from and employed to the best of his efforts. At the very end of this work, 
Harry Haywood, in a last-ditch effort to save the party that he and countless others had worked to build and guide in the proper direction, reiterates the need for a consistent fight against U.S. imperialism as the main enemy of black people everywhere and calls for an alliance with the white working class based upon common revolutionary aims, foreshadowing formations like the Rainbow Coalition spearheaded by Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party a decade later. He ends the text with a clarion call of, quote, international solidarity with the heroic struggles for national liberation, peace, and socialism, which embrace the vast majority of humankind. And that is how the text ends. So with that, let's move on to section two, discussion questions. First, I have a question for Brad. So part of the incredible insight that Haywood displays uh, here is his recognition that the question of self-determination wasn't just an issue of black liberation, but was part of a broader struggle between revisionism and reformism and revolutionary socialism. So he clearly explains how what appeared to really be a singular issue was part of a much broader ideological and line struggle. So my question for you is, do you think that similarly, there's specific issues debated among the left today that represent a side of struggle between revisionism and revolutionary lines? Okay, so great question. Uh, my answer is absolutely. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I think that the question of self-determination itself still exists as a site of struggle between revisionists and revolutionaries. In fact, it's a monumental site of struggle and absolutely essential to the direction of our movement. Uh, the three biggest examples of this surround black liberation, indigenous liberation, and, the, and those oppressed by imperialism. So in the case of black liberation, much of the dividing lines of class that Haywood addresses in this text still exist, and I am of the firm belief that his conception of self-determination and natural li liberation still holds as the revolutionary position, in my opinion, while a division of the black community along class lines is still exploited by the ruling class for their own interests. I mean, right now, we have this whole Jay-Z and, and Colin Kaepernick thing, which is playing out in the NFL. Many black liberationists directing ire at Jay-Z's move to join the NFL and reiterating their support for Kaepernick and their opposition to the fundamentally racist policies of the NFL and its white billionaire owners. It's a microcosm to be sure, but it still represents the fact that those divides are still playing out in our society today as those contradictions within the black liberation movement have not been resolved. When we move to indigenous struggles, we see ostensibly left formations either totally ignoring the issues of decolonization and sovereignty or dismissing them as ethno-nationalist projects and therefore not worth supporting, seemingly fully content to build a social democracy on stolen land. In the case of imperialism, you have white chauvinists on the left using instances of imperialist aggression to air out their critiques of global south movements or even actively engaging in the sort of rhetoric that the U.S. imperialist state and its ideological state apparatuses like the corporate media employ against leaders of anti-imperialist movements in the global south. So all of these examples highlight the fact that questions of self-determination are still central to the struggle against revisionism and play out in a myriad of ways, both inside and outside of formal organizations. In all of these cases, we as principled communists should study figures like Lenin, Stalin, Mao, Haywood, and Fanon and learn from our indigenous comrades on these issues to ensure we protect ourselves and our movements against such chauvinism and revisionism. Now, in regards to other issues that represent the struggle between revisionist and revolutionary lines, there are certainly plenty, but a dominant one is the issue of pursuing a fundamentally electoral path versus a fundamentally revolutionary one rooted in mass work, right? So this side of struggle plays out, I mean, recently largely within and around the Democratic Socialist of America with like internal caucuses representing both the right revisionist trends as well as the more left revolutionary trends. Now, if the DSA stays mired in these contradictions with no resolution, you will see it diminish and devolve further over time, defaulting more and more towards liberalism, all while alienating itself further from the proletariat. Now, of course, the DSA isn't a communist or Marxist party, but it is large for an ostensibly socialist organization and can act as a bridge for people leaving liberalism and moving left, and therefore it does deserve our attention. In any case, if we were able to create a principled revolutionary Marxist party in this society, that struggle would almost certainly occur within that party as well, as it played out in the CPUSA and numerous other communist organizations and parties throughout time and space. So paying attention to these formations and contradictions, even for those of us well outside of the DSA, can actually be incredibly instructive for our own projects going forward. That's how I would answer that. What are your thoughts, Allison? Allison? 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with all that. I think really what's striking reading this text is the extent to which the debates that we have about self-determination go this far back. And I think you're really correct to note that really that is one of the struggles where revisionism versus revolutionary mind does play out today. And really when I look at sort of what I see as the more advanced groups who are pushing an anti-revisionist line, they also are usually focusing on self-determination for the black diaspora in the United States, for indigenous people, and also for the struggle against imperialism in the global South. So I think that especially remains an issue that unfortunately is still where that ideological struggle is still being waged. For sure. Do you, do you pretty much agree with my with my second half about the DSA and, and the electoral path versus the revolutionary one? Do you think that's that's predominant? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I'm probably on the ultra left on the position of revolutions, yeah, yeah. as I've established <laughs> over and over again. But I do think that is a key site where it's being worked out. And, you know, even in my own writing, one thing that I've said is for whatever criticisms I may have of certain aspects of the Maoist movement within the United States, I think it's generally the Maoists who understand the correct position on electoralism in their general opposition towards it and their claims that the masses already are kind of fed up with electoral politics and that, it, you know, electoralism is in a sense a form of tailism. Them. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So my question for you, um, you know, in this text, Harry Haywood talks about white chauvinism and he talks about it in the context of revisionism within the CPUSA and how it developed and what interests it served. So in what ways does white chauvinism manifest on the North American left today and how can we combat it in a structural way within our organizations and cadres? Sure. So I think that manifests in a lot of ways that will probably overlap with what you already discussed. But I think the national question is obviously a debate where this still occurs. So one thing that you see over and over again in debates about the national question, self-determination, is this idea that self-determination, national liberation divides the working class in some way that's particularly problematic and that we need a united working class to fight against capitalism. I've seen this idea from left communists. Unfortunately, I've seen it from Leninists of various stripes, and I've seen it from anarchists of various stripes. It crops up in a lot of different contexts. And I think that this is really a problem today because this sort of position has a hidden chauvinism within it in that it assumes that our current situation is one in which the working class isn't already divided against itself. The idea that dividing the working class is something we might do assumes that there is a unified working class, which isn't the case. And I actually think has a chauvinist function of obscuring the way that the working class has internal divisions within it already, and that those those divisions play out in particular ways in relation to nation and race. So one thing that I think Haywood talks about that's really important that's still applicable today is the fact that even the proletarianization of black workers did not create unification between black and white workers. In many ways, it elevated white workers in relation to black workers. And so while it is important to have unity between white and black workers, that unity isn't achieved by the chauvinist idea of, well, we need to just stop dividing the class. We can't pay attention to national liberation and race. We just need the united working class. We have to take into account, in fact, that that unity is already fractured and that national liberation can be a part of the struggle against that. So I think a lot of instances of white chauvinism that we see today plays out that way in sort of this attempt to build a colorblind kind of Marxism that downplays the importance of national liberation and that ultimately obscures the way that white workers are benefited by anti-black oppression and the exploitation of a black nation that exists within the United States. So that's really one crucial place where white chauvinism, I think, really still plays out today that Haywood can help us understand better. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. This this whole idea of prodding those assumptions, I mean, because like, you say the, the implicit assumption behind that argument is that the, the, the working class is either already united or that these people actually have the power to unite them by downplaying these important issues that are essential to the working class broadly. So I totally agree. And in this text, I mean, Haywood himself says it is impossible for the working class in the United States to organize an effective revolutionary movement and advance the socialism without fighting for full freedom uh, to the Negro nation in the Deep South. And I would also include indigenous people in that. So any attempt to to jettison these these concerns about black liberation and indigenous liberation, uh, all for this idea of uniting the working classes is nonsense. It's founded on fallacious assumptions and it should be you know fought back and combated whenever possible.
So I guess this question sort of relates to the first question, but uh, Haywood is really talking about struggles within the CPUSA as well as, uh, you know, that led to his eventual expulsion. And in many ways, I believe that Haywood's position of critiquing revisionism within the CPUSA led to the broader anti-revisionist movement in the USA, laying a lot of the groundwork for turning towards Maoist China as a source of inspiration and sort of the opposition to revisionism that would mark a lot of the new communist movement. So my question really is, do you think that such an anti-revisionist position, like really centering anti-revisionism, is still necessary for the left today. Yeah, I think it is without a doubt. Now, it can be taken too far, right? It can be turned into this dogmatic thing that you use against anybody and everybody for any reason. And we have seen people sort of use this this accusation of revisionism in that way, which I think is ultimately sort of unhealthy and, and can represent a threat if, if taken to that level. But overall, I think anti-revisionism like is essential without a doubt. I think one can obviously and easily draw a line from the anti-revisionism of Harry Haywood to the founding of the Black Panther Party, which was anti-revisionist to the point of embracing Mao Zedong thought. Mao himself was a great anti-revisionist, pointing out the errors in the Soviet Union under Khrushchev and theorizing and putting into use concepts like the mass line and the cultural revolution, specifically in order to combat this revisionism within the party. Um, so if, if I stand in a Marxist tradition, I definitely stand in this one, this anti-revisionist, Marxist-Leninist, Maoist sort of tradition. And as we have already established, revisionism is and will continue to be a problem inside of a communist party and during a socialist transition. There will always be currents, especially in these earlier phases of socialist transition, that will push toward opportunism, liberalism, and the capitalist road. Now, at times, this will be a conscious effort on their part, but at other times, it will just be like a manifestation of unprincipled work, messy or incoherent theory, trying to form big tent socialism, etc. In any case, history has proven time and time again that if we hope to build a truly successful proletarian movement out of the rot and decay of capitalist imperialism, we will have to build anti-revisionism into our organizations and will have to actively combat revisionist and opportunist trends within our midst. And in fact, one of the reasons why I admire your work so much, Allison, is precisely because you are carrying on this essential tradition within Marxism-Leninism that Marx and Engels fought, that Lenin and Rosa fought, that Haywood and Mao fought, which is a tradition of anti-revisionism, a part of which is the clarifying of these divides and problems within the context of a specific struggle in space and time. In our case, we're operating within the North American communist left in 2019. You just released an article which will be read in audio format by you and put in our Patreon this month where you do exactly this sort of work. So any communist movement which lacks a robust anti-revisionist strain will, in my opinion, and almost by definition, begin to default towards liberalism. It will alienate its proletarian base and its marginalized members, as we see within the, D the DSA currently, and work against the core goals of our movement, which are and should be centered on self-determination for oppressed peoples, the staunch and militant opposition to imperialism, and the liberation of oppressed nationalities within the American and Canadian states, all with the goal of overthrowing the national and global dictatorship of the bourgeoisie and the construction of international socialism over the long term. So yes, anti-revisionism, in my opinion, is still necessary for the left today and will actually continue to be necessary until capitalism and imperialism are ultimately are mostly defeated, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I think particularly insightful in terms of what you bring up is this idea that it might not even be an intentional resurgence of revisionism that occurs within the movement. One thing that, you know, going back to Mao that we talked about on contradiction that's important to remember is that contradictions are internal to all things, and that includes the communist movement, and it even includes socialist transitionary states. You have internal contradictions which still exist there. And so, yeah, no matter what, we're still always going to have the need, I think, to center anti-revision in order to counter the tendency for opportunist elements to crop up, which has just been a consistent problem. I mean, really one thing that I think has really impacted me has been some of our comrades affiliated with the Austin uh, Revolutionary Organizing Committee who wrote, I think, an interesting critique of the Marxist Center where they sort of said, like, revisionism and the denigration into liberalism has to be at the center of our analysis because it's really hard to point to any American revolutionary movement that didn't succumb to them. And I 
I think that's incredibly true. When you look to the hundred years of communist struggle in the U.S., over and over again, you see capitulation to revisionism and to liberalism. And so that need for attentiveness to it, specifically and directly, I think is really incredibly important and something that we need to put at the forefront of both our theorizing, but also our sort of internal organizing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and wield those accusations of, of revisionism responsibly. I mean, understand what you're saying when you call somebody revisionist. But yes, like definitely employ anti-revisionism as it's essential and will continue to be. All right. So now it is time to move on to section three, where we apply the contents of this work to our current conditions and sort of expand on some ideas and make arguments and points about how it is relevant to our current conditions. For my first application section in our third part, uh, I kind of want to note the way that this debate about black self-determination is still alive and well today, and I also kind of want to reference some of the interaction that we, me and Brett, as podcasters have had around our discussions of Red Menace with the Communist Party USA. Um, so interestingly, a uh, few episodes back, I don't remember which one specifically, I referenced Haywood as an example of sort of what the vanguard ought to be, and I mentioned that uh, you know, at a certain point, the Communist Party USA really was an incredible vanguard that fell to revisionism. And uh, that seems to have gotten the attention of the CPUSA in a really interesting <laughs> way. And uh, since then, they've sort of responded to a lot of the stuff that we've put out just in tweet format. And when we announced that we were going to be covering this episode, they actually, or this book, they actually tweeted two articles at us. Um, I presume in response to the ideas that Haywood puts forward, it's a little unclear since there wasn't a lot of explanation. So I just kind of wanted to address that real quick and contextualize this debate within what the CPUSA now says about the uh, issues Haywood raises. So the first article that they tweeted at us uh, was simply a copy of a letter that Angela Davis sent to the party prior to their most recent Congress, in which she praises them for their uh, militant struggle against capitalism. Uh, there's not really much else in this article other than that letter from Davis and and again, I'm not very clear how it relates to Haywood or why it might contradict Haywood or why it might speak something to our decision to cover Haywood. And in a sense, it actually kind of feels like tokenism to me to respond to Haywood's criticism with a tweet that basically just reads as, quote, well, a prominent black woman likes us. And, you know... I just don't really feel comfortable with that. I don't understand what the purpose of it was. I admire and I respect the work of Davis very, very much, especially her work on prison abolition, but nothing contained in that letter was relevant to Haywood's uh, ideas in this text or to our decision to cover it, and I'm a little baffled by it. But the second article that they responded with is significantly more substantive and actually directly on this question, and that article is called Leninism and the African-American National Question of Reply to Halibi, which was published on their website. So this article uh, is mostly focused on drawing a distinction between an oppressed nation and an oppressed national minority, arguing that black people in the U.S. only constitute a national minority. They don't fully constitute a nation. Now, this ought to remind us, actually, of some of the early responses the party made to Haywood, where they said that uh, eventually black people in the U.S. might achieve nationhood, but the conditions aren't there quite yet. They still need to be developed further. And so in order to pursue this uh, argument, they cite Du Bois, who argued that black people in the U.S. again might come close to being an oppressed nation, but ultimately conclude that the term nation is not applicable. Now, on the one hand, I find this interesting because, you know, Haywood studied with the common turn. He had approval from Stalin on this thesis. So for Stalin's work to then be dogmatically applied to say that Haywood has not adequately proved that black people constitute a nation is a little ironic given that historical context. It's even more ironic because part of the criticism the party made of Haywood was that he was dogmatically applying Stalin to prove that black people constituted a nation in the United States. And so in a sense, it feels like the party wants to have it both ways. The CPUSA today maintains that the self-determination thesis is outdated and that black people do not meet the common turn's own definition of a nation and insists that the ultimate goal of, black, of the black populace in the U.S. is not secession or self-determination, but is equality with white workers. That is the stance that they put forward in this article. This assertion does not, however, respond to Haywood's own insistence that reformism and gradualism have not created that equality and that only national revolution can create the conditions for black liberation. 
Nation. The party insists that, quote, decade after decade, the fight for African American freedom was defined by combating Jim Crow segregation and systemic institutionalized racial oppression in, er in every area of life. And all of this by voting, boycotts, sit ins, occupations, strikes, and unity with any and all who would join the effort, particularly the labor movement, end quote. Now, the emphasis here that they want to drive home is that black liberation struggles have continued without self determination or nationalistic aspects appended onto them, and they believe that this can help achieve this goal of equality. But I'm going to be honest, we must ask, has voting, boycotting, sit-ins, and strikes led to equality? Has the revisionist position of gradualism been proven correct? And the answer is, of course not. Segregation exists today as a de facto phenomena enforced through redlining, gentrification, and through cultural hostility towards Black people and white communities. As of this year, police killings are the leading cause of death for young Black men. The prison population continues to swell and overcrowd, primarily because of overcriminalization of Black population populations, with 37% of male prisoners being black men. Where exactly has the peaceful, reformist, and gradualist strategies of the CPUSA continues to support gotten us in terms of black liberation? And I ask this question in all earnesty and honesty. I don't know about you, but when I look around, I'd say they haven't gotten us very fucking far at all. History has not vindicated the revisionists, and the praise of Angela Davis that the party is so quick to use to dismiss their critics does not change that. Semantic bickering over the difference between an oppressed nation and a national minority does not change the failure of the reformist strategy. These semantic distinctions are an attempt to obfuscate the utter and complete failure of the gradualist approach and to move the conversation away from concrete revolutionary strategy. Quite simply, the approach that the CPUSA has implemented has not achieved black liberation in the U.S., and in fact, we see more insidious forms of anti-black oppression and exploitation crop up every day. The party, unfortunately, remains on the revisionist path and rejects revolutionary struggle for black liberation today. It is my sincere hope that they will change that, that they will reassess it. I know there are internal voices within the CPUSA who disagree with their line. I know that now that Sam Webb is no longer the chairman, there is a larger movement of leftists within the party pushing back against the ideas. And I hope as strongly as I can hope that they can, will win, but that is not the current situation within the party and it remains on the revolutionary path. It's up to the rest of us who organize external to it to do better and support the right to black self-determination as the path for black liberation in the United States. Amen. I mean, I could not have said it better. And, you know, Allison and I don't read each other's points of application often before we go on on record. And I haven't I didn't read that in its entirety, but I'm completely in agreement with it. And in fact, my application point here echoes many of those those same arguments. So um, very well said. And now I'll get into my uh, my application point. So for my points of application, I want to do some clarifying work on how this text from the 1950s is still relevant to our society today, and even how some of these uh, splits within the black liberation movement in the U.S. still play out today. And I also want to use hindsight to test out the theory by the revisionists of Haywood's time that gradual reform and integration into the American culture and economy would decrease racial prejudice and violence over time until black people were fully assimilated into one big American family. So let's address the former point first. Now, the splits between black nationalism, black liberal capitalist integrationism, and Marxism go back to before Harry Haywood, but Haywood was certainly one of the most well-known figures trying to parse out these splits from a principled Marxist position, no less. Haywood was a black nationalist, but not in the way that the Nation of Islam are black nationalists. Haywood is, was not a black supremacist, and he did not filter his understandings of black liberation through any religious mythology. Haywood's black nationalism was in the context of Marxism and national liberation. In the decade after Haywood wrote this piece, Malcolm X rose to prominence as perhaps the major voice of militant black nationalism in the country. And while he certainly rejected liberalism, it wasn't until later in life that he began to at least come to see the contours of what socialism could offer his movement. After his trip to Mecca, in which he experienced racial relations for the first time outside of the American context, and having already parted ways with the Nation of Islam and their ideology which rejected any sort of solidarity across race, Malcolm X began not only to talk more about capitalism and socialism explicitly, but also to show increasing international solidarity with national liberation movements, tying the struggle of black people in the United States to oppressed peoples around the world, trying to throw off the chains of colonialism 
and imperialism. He met with Fidel Castro in Harlem, for example, and actually met with and worked alongside Haywood for a time. Tragically, of course, Malcolm X was assassinated by the Nation of Islam at the young age of 39 years old, before he could really develop this new trajectory that he was on. However, the Black Panther Party picked up where X had left off, and I think it would be very hard to imagine the Black Panther Party arising how it did without the earlier works of people like Haywood and Malcolm X. In any case, the split between black nationalism, which rejected or dismissed class struggle, and Marxism, which centered it, played out within the Black Panther Party itself, resulting happily in the victory of the anti-revisionist Marxist line. Now, going back, we also have another towering figure of black liberation in America, Martin Luther King Jr. Although he was certainly a revolutionary of a sort, MLK for much of his time tended to support a more liberal integrationist line against the militant black nationalism and Marxism of that time. Though importantly, towards the end of his life, MLK too was making a move away from capitalism and toward a sort of Marxist-informed democratic socialism. It should be noted that MLK studied Marxism in college and wrote papers on it and was not naive about what it was or what it offered. And like clockwork, the moment MLK began trying to unite and organize poor people across race and gender to march on Washington, D.C., he too was assassinated. Soon after MLK's assassination, the FBI began a harsher crackdown on the Black Panthers, including the infiltration of the organization, playing on and creating sectarian splits where it could, and even assassinating charismatic and effective leaders like Fred Hampton until the Black Panther Party itself was dead too. So these contradictions between black nationalism, liberal integrationism into capitalism, and militant class struggle Marxism have and continue to play out in the black liberation movements within the United States today. Understanding this history and studying it is actually essential for anyone who wants to grasp this dialectic firmly. Now let's move on to testing one of the revisionist theories that Haywood attacked. The theory that through incremental reforms and integration, the virulent anti-black racism of America would decrease and disappear over time. In the text we read for today, Haywood spends some time talking about how revisionists in the party would argue that racial prejudice was a moral problem as opposed to a structural, political, and economic problem of exploitation and domination, and that it was the primary thing to be combated. Haywood rightfully mocked this idea that the focus on moralism and incrementalism could go anywhere meaningful for the masses of oppressed black people as it centered moralism over class struggle and combating imperialism. The revisionists and liberals of his time insisted that gradual reforms could eradicate over time the oppression of black people in this society, and therefore a revolutionary national liberation struggle was not needed or desired. So we should ask ourselves, Sitting as we are with 60 years of time between the writing of this text and today, has anti-black racism gone away, given the fact that racism being seen as immoral is actually pretty much accepted as fact by the majority of Americans? Notice I said that the idea that racism is immoral is accepted, but the actual actions and behavior of racism continue to this day. In fact, as a side note, there was a recent video of a white woman calling out two black women in a restaurant, and the local news team caught up with her and asked her, you know, what was this about? Do you apologize? She sat there in front of the camera, called them the N-word again, said that she would do exactly what she did in that video again, but then insisted that she wasn't racist. (laughs) So so this dichotomy between actual racist behavior and admitting that you're racist as or admitting that racism is immoral is interesting because you can have hardcore bigots who admit that racism is immoral but still do the most racist shit imaginable. So that's kind of a side note, but I digress. The the, the idea here is that, of course not. As Allison said, this has not led to any form of liberation, and anti-black racism is just as alive and well today as it's ever been. So just yesterday, I read an article about how one out of every 1,000 black men will die at the hands of police, over 2.5 times more than their white counterparts. In just the 19 years of this century alone, we've seen how the U.S. state responded to black people in peril in Katrina after the hurricane, how the Great Recession empirically devastated black families and black wealth more than white ones, and how police violence against black people is pretty much accepted in our society as the status quo, and police virtually never get held accountable for their crimes against black victims. 
not to mention the nativist and violently racist yet completely successful campaign of Donald Trump, who just on the campaign trail alone incited his followers into racist violence. At various Trump campaign speeches, black people were seen being isolated and shoved around by white mobs, spit on by white men, and in at least one case, sucker punched in the face by a white Trump supporter as he was being escorted out by security for peacefully protesting. Since Trump's election, hate crimes have spiked significantly in every major U.S. city, and a resurgent fascist movement has risen, piling up bodies as it tears through our cities, tiki torches and Sieg hail signs held high. Despite the flowery rhetoric of the Obama years, and despite the fact that the average American bigot has a much easier time actively being racist than admitting that they are racist, it would seem that those who argue that racism was merely a moral failure that would be rooted out in time through gradualist reforms and integration were completely and objectively wrong. And those who, like Haywood, argued that U.S. capitalist imperialism is structurally racist, and only by severing ties with it and combating it globally could anything like equality for the masses of black people be truly achieved, we're correct. And this is still true today. There can be no liberation for black people or indigenous people as a whole inside of the United States political and economic system. The best it can do, using liberal identity politics as its guiding force, is elevate a small number of people from oppressed groups into the ruling class and then try to convince the rest of us that their success is the success of all people from that identity group. In order for true liberation for everyone to be possible, the U.S. capitalist imperialist state and its allies must be defeated in their entirety and brought under the hegemonic rule of the global proletariat. The very existence of the United States is founded on genocide and slavery and white supremacy. As radicals, we understand that you can only address a problem by striking at its roots. And in the case of the United States, its roots are rotten and soaked in blood. You can't have beautiful flowers of liberation blossom on a plant whose roots and leaves are, a, are dead and whose cells are cut off from the sun's photosynthetic light. You can't reform a corpse. The problem of racism and white supremacy in the United States is not a moral one. It's a structural one, an institutional one, and it serves certain interests. Therefore, you cannot solve it by small reforms, incremental electoralism, or appeals to the moral conscience of white racists and members of the ruling class. You can only solve it through superior organization, genuine internationalism, solidarity across racial and ethnic differences, and militant class struggle. In short, Harry Haywood was right, and that's why we study him. Allison? Incredibly well said. So, yeah, again, we're going to go over some of the same stuff, but I want to go ahead and just insist that Haywood ought to remind us today of the centrality of black liberation to communist organizing. So as we've talked about already, many on the socialist left regard issues of race and white supremacy as secondary concerns to be relegated to an afterthought at best, but often treated as a distraction from class at worst. I've written about this a lot. My most recent piece talks about this fairly in depth, but this problem is endemic to the left in North America. And Haywood shows us that this chauvinist attitude is fucking nonsense and demonstrates that the way that the national question links Marxism and revolutionary struggle to the struggle against white supremacy and anti-black racism is crucial for us to understand. The shadow of slavery still exists today. It has not disappeared through reformism or through integration. Anti-black violence and exploitation and oppression continue in various forms today. The revisionists were wrong. Jim Crow emerged in new, more insidious forms. The exploitation of black labor shifted to the prisons as a continuation of slavery and free unplayed labor by black people. The isolation of black workers within dangerous fields has continued alongside a violent and intense lupin proletarianization of much of the urban black populace within the United States. Contrary to the hopes of the gradualist, capitalist development in the 61 years since this piece was published has not led to integration and equality. Anti-black violence has only taken new, more various, and insidious forms. While we all regularly see videos of black people slaughtered by white pigs on TV, on the news, cheered on by the American right wing with their thin blue line flags, the struggle still defines this era now as much as it ever has, and we cannot 
overcome capitalism by taking a revisionist and gradualist approach which denies the need for revolution. And if we are going to achieve a mass revolutionary movement, we will need to form a vanguard among all the classes, as Lenin argued in what is to be done. The party that Lenin advocated for is a party that is involved in all struggles against capitalism, and that unites these struggles with training and with theory. This means we cannot abandon any site of struggle. Black liberation is still central. We can't build such a party if we do not work within the struggle for black liberation. And Haywood shows us that this struggle has to take the form of national liberation and self-determination. This is not a secondary concern. It is central to the contradictions of global imperialism, of which the U.S. is the key player today. Whenever and wherever we are organizing, we must connect to black organizers in our communities and provide support for the struggles that are already ongoing against white supremacy going on around us. We must build bridges between the communist movement and the movement for black liberation and not call for a false unity, but recognize that white workers are benefited by the super exploitation of black workers and realize that the working class is already divided by race. Opposition to whiteness is a requirement for white communists and we must actively fight against it. We have to link our struggles with black struggles against prisons, against police violence, and against gentrification, which are going on all around us and quite frankly are already at the forefront of class struggle in this country today. It's only by taking the ideas that Haywood presents us with seriously and integrating them into our organizational work now that we can build a revolutionary movement and take a revolutionary path that has any chance of overcoming global capitalism and the American empire that sits on top of it today. Yeah. Absolutely. Incredibly well said. We, we covered some of the same ground, but we did it importantly, and it's an absolute essential lesson to pull out of this text. And so we wanted to really reiterate that. Um, so yeah, Allison, would you like to, to do the outro for us? Yeah, definitely. So as always, thank you so much for listening. We know that this was very heavy on the analysis side of things. It's a very dense text that is also kind of difficult to break up thematically. We hope that we've done it justice and that by taking extra time, we've really gone into some of the details of it so you can understand the nuance and the contours of Haywood's arguments. We really appreciate your support listening in. We incredibly appreciate all of our Patreon supporters who make this possible for us to continue to do this podcast. And as always, we would love to hear your thoughts about what we're doing and what we can change or what you like and i'm sure we'll hear many people's thoughts about this episode because <laughs> it is a controversial subject that will probably make a certain group of people mad and that's okay because it is pushing the struggle around these issues and i believe that that's important so again for next month we're going to be covering wretched of the earth by fanon it is a longer text we might split that up into multiple episodes we're still figuring that out but go ahead and start reading on that it, as most of the text we've talked about can be found online or you can just go to a library it's a very famous book and we look forward to diving into it Thank you so much for your support, and we hope you have a great night.